Daily Bread Drive Through. We're here. We're in Proverbs. We're about to get it in. Today, you are catching the desk mad, mad scientist style. Uh, I've got books out. I am getting deeper in the Proverbs than personally I've ever gotten. I'm excited. Uh, I love what I'm seeing. Uh, got the DJ Annie here. Uh, don't worry about the creaking. She just bumped into our heavy bag right behind her. So it's got a nice little creak going on. Can everyone hear me? Am I loud and clear? Because I want to dive in. I want to dive in. Can everyone hear me? Am I crystal clear? Please let me know. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs. What are they saying, my sweetheart, Annie? Am I clear? Just want to make sure I'm clear that the headphones are in. We found the solution. We found the solution. The new Super AirPods. Uh, have replaced all the microphones, no more issues. So I'm clear, they said I'm good? Okay, hey, let's give it up for DJ Annie because she's moving out today. My daughter is moving out, starts her corporate job Monday, moving out, but only 25 minutes away. But uh, she's recorded some 260 episodes of the Daily Bread drive through uh, You said it's changed your walk, increased your knowledge of the word a lot. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. Well, look, let's get in Proverbs, okay? Let's do this. Um, Proverbs. Yesterday was an intro. I'm excited, but I want to take it a bit slow because I want to walk you guys through some resources today. I really want to put Proverbs where it is biblically. That's all I'm out to do. Um, it is a book that we all naturally respect. It is a book that we know every time we hear a nugget from it, we have this desire not just to know more, but actually to live it. It's beautiful, right? Uh, there's not one proverb that we read as spiritually regenerated men and women and say, uh, nah, that, that looks whack. Uh, that doesn't look good. We are drawn to proverbs. So what I want to do is just put it where it belongs biblically, okay? So I want to share resources. I want to walk you guys through some stuff. Let's take it slow, okay? Um, a proverb. What is a proverb? Yesterday, we looked at God's wisdom and even giving us the book of Proverbs. Remember, unless you were a prophet, a priest, or a king, you did not readily have the scriptures in your hands or even in your home in Old Testament times. Proverbs, it's a way of taking very deep concepts and encapsulating them in pithy statements, loaded statements. In other words, what if Solomon wrote a lecture on pride. Who would be able to memorize that as easily as a proverb that says, pride goes before destruction? That's in the book of Proverbs. So it's God's wisdom in even giving us this. Um, Proverbs, some believe that proverb comes from the Latin word proverbium, uh, which is a set of words put forth, meaning a saying to support a bigger point, a set of words, right? put forth to speak of a whole large concept, right? So proverbium, the Latin word, a set of words put forth, uh, a saying supporting a bigger point, a small saying supporting a bigger point. The other word for proverb um, actually is the Hebrew word mashal. Um, First Kings chapter four, verse 32, it says that King Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs in the span of his career as king. Uh, when it says First Kings 4.32 that he wrote 3,000 proverbs, the Hebrew word for proverb, the Hebrew word is mashal, M-A-S-H-A-L, and it means a comparison or an allegory. Well, no wonder when we read the book of Proverbs, we're going to see Solomon making, um, likening the wise man's work ethic to the ant. Uh, likening the wise man or the lazy man's work ethic, you know, to uh, another type of animal. So it's, you see a lot of allegories there. So it makes sense. Um, let's see. The main word in the book of Proverbs is wisdom, right? That's the main word. It occurs 125 times. So it's clear that the spiritual walk, the victorious walk, the blessed walk, the godly walk, the godlike walk, the walk of looking like God. That's what we were created to do. 
That's why we find such frustration, such angina, such heartburn when we're not walking according to God's ways. Uh, Even Proverbs says, the way of the transgressor is hard. The life of the person that crosses God's lines over and over as a practice is a hard life. It's a hard knock life, right? So the main word here is wisdom. And we just need to remember Matthew 22, verse 37, we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. And there's one other element, all of our mind, the spiritual walk, the victorious walk, the walk that wins, the favorable walk actually is a thinking man's game. Um, The word for wisdom, before we go on, we've defined proverb in the Latin. We've defined proverb in the Hebrew. Now we want to look at this word wisdom. Again, wisdom occurs 125 times in the book of Proverbs. We want to define wisdom because a lot of people, you know, have a hard time knowing the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Uh, Proverbs is the book of wisdom. It's about wisdom. What is wisdom? Let's look at the scriptures. Um, I'm actually going to read from Exodus 31. I'm going to read a set of verses from Exodus 31, and here's the scenario. Moses is on top of the mountain. He is receiving the instruction to build the tabernacle in the wilderness right after he's led the Israelites across the Red Sea. He's up in the mount. God is communing with him. This is what God says, because he's breaking down to Moses. Moses, you're going to make a tabernacle like this. You're going to make gold tapestries. You're going to make golden angels for the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to do this work with silver, silver sockets. He's talking about metal work. He's talking about um, sewing. He's talking about uh, working with, with gems and, and, and gemology, if you will. But Moses can easily get overwhelmed. But this is what God says to him. Check it. Exodus 31, when he's done giving him all of the blueprint in the prior chapters, Exodus 31, because we want to see how the Bible defines wisdom. That's what we want to see, how the Bible defines wisdom. It says, Exodus 31, and the Lord spoke unto Moses and said, see, verse two, it's almost like, have no fear, Moses. Don't be overwhelmed by me giving you all these instructions for building and sewing and metalwork. I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri. Uh, Verse three, I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. Verse six, Exodus 31. And behold, I've given with him uh, Aholiab, the son of Ahizdamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom. There is the word again, that they may make everything that I've commanded. So in verse six, underline the word wisdom. God says, I've put the wisdom in these men to do the metalwork needed. I've put the wisdom in these men to do the architecture for the tabernacle that I've just shown you. The Hebrew word there for wisdom actually is the word that speaks of skill. So the difference between knowledge and wisdom is knowledge is just what's in our head. Wisdom is the skill in applying it. Every time we see wisdom used in scripture, it's in the context of properly applying what you know. So you can be as smart as they come. You can have so much biblical knowledge, but actually be a fool, actually have no wisdom. The Pharisees had all the knowledge, but totally did not know how to apply anything, uh, looked nothing like God and even crucified their Lord when he came among them. So it's not just what we know and it's not just applying what we know, it is skillfully and properly applying what we know. That's wisdom. That's what Proverbs is here to do. Um, It's also interesting that you will find the same word used um, in Psalm 107 verse 27. In Psalm 107, verse 27, it talks about how God can make the raging sea that makes even the best sailors be at their wits end. Now you wonder where that idiom came from? I'm at my wits end. That's from Psalm 107, verse 27. But the Hebrew word for wit is the same, same, same word used in Exodus 31, verse 6. They're at their wits end. They're uh, running out of The storm is so bad, they're running out of how to apply the right knowledge. So again, wisdom is 
how I properly apply what I know. Look, this is convicting even for me because I think sometimes there could be such a chasm between what I know and applying it at the right time. So many times we walk away from a situation, ah, I could have handled that better. Ah, I could have spoken better. Oh, in the face of slander and gossip, I could have done this. Or man, did I just give in to slander and gossip? Or did I apply this readily here? Or, you know, you walk away in so many instances lamenting that you did not apply what you know. Proverbs is here to change us. So look, if you wanna become more wise, um, then you're in the right book. We need to remember this too. It's not just a matter of taking in uh, the wisdom of God, um, but it's also being a proverb ourselves. Because remember, a proverb is a encapsulated statement relaying a larger point, right? It is a pithy statement saying a mouthful uh, in moral discretion, in moral action, in mental discernment. Write down 1 Kings 9, 7. He says to the Israelites, if you guys don't listen to me, you will go into a captivity, uh, you will be chastened, and you will be a proverb among the nations. He's saying in that instance, you will be a proverb, meaning when people look at how I chasten you and punish you for disobedience, you'll be a walking proverb where people are like, whoa, I don't want to be like those Israelite people. God's design was that they would be a proverb for good. So here's the statement of the day. Every one of us in every instance is going to be a proverb. Do we want to be a proverb showing people uh, the beauty of the blessed life? Or do we want to be a proverb showing people uh, the, the dangers of being a knucklehead? Every one of us is not only going to be called to walk in God's Proverbs, but whether we do or not, we will be a proverb. We're, when we walk out the door, when we deal with our family, you know, we're a proverb. We're, it says in the word that we're living epistles. We're the Bible that a lot of people uh, read. We may be the only Bible some people ever get to read. How are we behaving? No, it's deep. So um, let's back up a bit, right? Um, And talk just about Uh, wisdom literature. Um, For starters, just to show you how amazing this book is, um, and just to show you um, how much this book is before you even more than you know, because I think a lot of us could fall into the trap of, you know, just feeling like, uh, well, you know, Proverbs is good. I know, you know, you can buy like a small Bible that has the Gospels and Psalms and Proverbs, but, you know, is it just for lovers of the Old Testament? Is it just for, you know, well, let's look at this. Um, Proverbs is quoted many times in the New Testament, uh, and it's actually quoted um, with a lot of verses that you may love from the New Testament and don't even realize that the writers of the New Testament are quoting Proverbs. What does that teach us? That teaches us that even our favorite authors, in fact, every author, it seems, of the New Testament quoted Proverbs. What does it mean? They regularly resorted to the book of Proverbs. Let's let's give you some of them. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 15. Romans chapter 3, verse 15. And for those who've just come on board, We've just defined what Proverbs means, a little bit of borrowing from yesterday's intro. Uh, We talked about the difference between knowledge and wisdom and how the Bible describes wisdom. Please listen if you've just jumped on. Now we're going to look at how some of our favorite New Testament verses actually are quoting the book of Proverbs. Uh, The book of Proverbs basically is quoted um, nine times. Nine times you have the book of Proverbs quoted in the New Testament. So uh, let, let's look at some of them because I just want to take it slow. Uh, so maybe you can realize, wow, I did not realize that some of these verses I'm reading over, whether it be Paul, Peter, James, that is actually coming from the book of Proverbs. It meant that Paul, Peter, and James were saturating themselves in the book of Proverbs. It was part of their normal life. It needs to be part of our normal life. Um, Romans 3.15 Romans 3.15, it says that the wicked, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways. That's quoting Proverbs 1.16. So Romans 3.15 is quoting Proverbs 1.16. What about Romans chapter 12, um, verse 16? Romans 12, verse 16 um, actually tells us, Um, don't be wise in your own eyes. That's quoting uh, Proverbs chapter three, verse seven. 
What about Romans 12, verse 20, uh, where it says, uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing this, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. That doesn't mean that you give someone when they're bitter, you kill them with kindness and make their face all scrunched up. Putting coals on someone's head was the equivalent of giving someone fire to be able to take home to actually warm their house. So if you ever have someone use that out of context, oh, I'm going to kill him with kindness. Oh, that person's bitter. I walked over to him and said, oh, God bless you. How are you? Oh, their face. They just looked all contorted and twisted. I just heaped coals of fire on their head. That's not what it's saying. It's actually wanting to bless them by putting the means on their head to go home and warm their home. But anyway, Romans chapter 12, verse 20, um, that actually the whole thing of heaping coals of fire on their head, that's actually Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. Hebrews 12, verses five and six, when it talks about despise not the chastening of the Lord for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. That's actually quoting Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. James 4, verse six. James 4, verse 6, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's actually quoting Proverbs 3, verse 34. Um, Pro, uh, James 4, verse 13 is quoting Proverbs 27, verse 1. 1 Peter 2, 17 is quoting Proverbs 24, 21. 1 Peter 4, 8 is quoting Proverbs 10, verse 12. 1 Peter 2, verse 18 is quoting Proverbs 11, verse 31. 2 Peter 2, 22 is quoting Proverbs 26, verse 11. So we now see that our wise big brothers who wrote the New Testament were well acquainted with the book of Proverbs. In fact, they brought it over and worked it into their epistles. That's wisdom, right? Them having the knowledge of Proverbs, and according to the biblical definition, applying that knowledge at the right time. When? Even when right in the New Testament, they were applying the book of Proverbs. Let's get in Proverbs. Let's know Proverbs. Let's be buried in Proverbs, okay? Let's get into something a little bit deep. Can we do that? Let's get into something a little bit deep, because, and then we are going to start to read. If you study your ancient literature, um, and mind you, I'm going to be working right now from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. It's by Gabelin. It's just one of the many uh, commentary volume sets that I have. But as I got into their breakdown of Proverbs, it's interesting because he's getting into how in the day when King Solomon wrote Proverbs, it was a common practice for kings, for wise men all around the world. All the greatest thinkers wrote Proverbs. The greatest thinkers, kings, wanted to live by pro Proverbs and wrote them to their children. You could even see in the ancient world, even in the pagan ancient world, discipling their children to the best of their ability, right? To the best of their ability, right? Uh, with what they felt was truth, they still walked in the virtue of discipling and discipling their children. As I did some studying this morning, and I really was getting rocked, it's interesting because, well, first, let me just, let me just, let me just back up. Let me just back up. In Acts 17, are we tripping in Acts 17 when Paul is reasoning with the Athenian philosophers and he actually quotes one of their own poets back to them? He's not saying that that poet uh, had divine wisdom, but he is saying that that poet had a great point that Paul wanted to use to support his bigger point about the reality of God and the gospel. Uh, so when we see um, Acts 17, verse 27, when Paul is reasoning with the Athenian philosophers and then says, uh, basically, you know, even your own poets, you know, have said the same thing. Uh, it's actually Acts 17, verse 28. He says, your own poets have said, we are the offspring of deity. He's saying, I just want to tell you about who that deity is. He's quoting from a poet by the name of Eratus, E-R-A-T-U-S. Now, the fact that Paul quotes from him, does that mean that, um, I don't know, that somehow that makes the scripture less inspired? 
The fact that Paul is quoting a, a pagan poet doesn't make the scriptures less inspired, not one bit. God can take anything because everything belongs to God. But once God breathes it, now it becomes divinely inspired. If you understand that, then you would not trip to know that, remember, King Solomon had dealings with kings all around the then known world as people came to seek his wisdom. First Kings chapter four. Let me actually just read it. And I think you should actually just know this. I think this is just one of those verses. If you want to just kind of know four or five verses that just summarize Solomon's life, I think you need to know First Kings 4, 32 uh, through 34. Um, basically, let's back up to verse 29. First Kings 4, 29 through 34. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country, and his wisdom exceeded, underline this, the wisdom of Egypt. I'm going to come back to that. For he was wiser than all men. Verse 32, and he spoke 3,000 Proverbs. His songs were 1,005. Verse 33, remember we said that proverb in the Hebrew means allegory? Well, verse 33, he spoke of trees from the cedar tree that's in Lebanon. He likened uh, the righteous life to a cedar tree. Remember the Hebrew word for proverb is allegory, right? The Latin word for proverb is a small set of words that carries a big point. Boom, let's keep it moving. I, I, I could tell you guys are rocking with it now. We're laying a very, the cement foundation is getting Thicker and it's firming up because we're going to be ready to journey through. I pray it's blessing you like it's blessing me. Verse 33, he spoke of trees from the cedar tree that's in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of birds and of creeping things and of fishes. There came all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. Yo, please follow me. I want to drop this point and then I got to get out of here. I want to check the time because um, I'm having a ball and I don't want to just be sitting here. Oh, this is dead. I need a time check. Uh, come on. We're going to just do a little time check here because we got to know what's going on. Uh, come on. Type in a little password just to get a time check. Okay. Four minutes. We're going to try and get out of here in four minutes. Okay. All right. Check it out. Solomon, you're going to see in Proverbs, right? Let's go back to Proverbs. You're going to go back to Proverbs. And we just read that all the kings of the East and all the kings came to get wisdom from Solomon. Yes? We're going to see that his wisdom exceeded the wisdom of even the Egyptians. Yes, we saw that. We just read that, right? So check this out. When he says in Proverbs 1 verse 5, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding will attain unto wise counsels, Proverbs 1.5. The Hebrew word for attain is a word da'at. It actually means not just intellectual acquisition, but experiential acquisition. It means that you get it by learning, like we're doing right now. You also get it through experience. By fumbling the ball, you understand the importance of holding the ball tighter experiential. Uh, by walking in it, you see the blessings that come. You know, we get a lot of our wisdom from making some real big, dumb mistakes too. That's why I like when it says, uh, a man of understanding, Proverbs 1.5, will attain unto wise counsel. The Hebrew word attain is intellectual acquisition and experiential acquisition. Even just through our dumbness, our wicked hearts, just major mess ups. We also experientially we experience the necessity and the, the need to have wisdom in our lives. We get a lot of our wisdom through folly, right? Okay. But he just said in Proverbs 1.5, a wise man will hear and increase learning. Check this out. How much are you willing to learn? Even when it's from people that you may not agree with everything with, uh, you know, people of a different worldview doesn't mean that you're learning about matters of salvation because we know that Christ alone is the only way to the Father because Jesus said so. We're not talking about matters of, I don't know, you know, um, salvation by faith alone, you know, through grace, you know, but when it just comes to uh, obtaining wisdom from others, from other cultures, from other people, I can show you proof 
that even though Solomon was the wisest man on the earth, and yo, you got to zero in now. I could show you proof that even though Solomon was the wisest man on the earth, as the kings were coming to him, he was he was he was peeping stuff they did and separating the meat from the bones and taking that wisdom and then God used it. Where am I going with this? There are lots of ancient manuscripts that have surfaced through archaeology that show that the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, Sumerians all had their own collections of proverbs. If you look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17, until Proverbs 24, verse 22, from Proverbs 22, verse 17 to Proverbs 24, verse 22, it is almost identical with the ancient Egyptian book of Proverbs called the Instructions of Amen M. Opeth. All right? Amen M. Opeth. Amen. Wait. Amen M. Opeth. Amen M. Opeth. A M E N E M O P E. Amen M. Opeth. Amen M O P. Amen M O P. Yeah, let's say that. The instructions of Amen M O P. Um, they basically were dated somewhere around 1580 to 1100 BC. And what it means is this: is that when these kings were coming to seek Solomon, he basically peeped their 30 sections of proverbs in the instructions of Amen O P. Right, and it so inspired him that he modeled three chapters of our book of Proverbs after that. Now, somebody want to say, oh yeah, well that proves that the Egyptians, you know, basically, you know, had everything and they had a trinity first and nah, nah, that's hogwash, okay? Uh, sorry, it, it just is, you know what I mean? Uh, and that's a whole other discussion if you want to get into um, how there is a malevolent being who wants to basically throw shade on the truth of God so there will be inspired myths um, of false trinities uh, and of false stories of resurrections because you have to understand this malevolent being, Lucifer, who comes as an angel of light, uh, knows who God is. So no wonder that he, if someone would get inspired to want to create a false trinity, whether it be Isis, uh, Osiris, and Horus or whatever else. So again, by Solomon being inspired by that, God can take that. Just as Paul quoted that Greek poet and it's still Bible once it hits Acts 17, outside of Acts 17, that pagan poet Aratus that the Athenians love, it is not inspired. It cannot change your life. Might have some wisdom to it, might be aiming at something good, but it can't change your life. It's not God breathed. But once Paul writes and through it being breathed by God's spirit, 2 Peter 1 verses 19 through 21, now it becomes holy writ. Once Solomon takes the instruction of Amenhotep and takes that framework and brings it and God breathes through it, now Proverbs becomes something that changes your life. That's what separates the book of Proverbs from all the other ancient proverb manuscripts. This is divinely inspired. As you read it, it changes you. Second Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, boom, right? And it actually um, is divinely inspired, right? And it is the absolute sayings of God's heart, Psalm 33. So that's what separates these Proverbs from others. Because look, I, I went through seven different worldviews before I came to the Lord. I've studied... Lebanese philosopher Khalil Gibran. I've studied Taoism. I've studied Buddhism. I've studied New Age. I've studied so many Proverbs. And what I found was that one, they fell short of godliness because it was not written from the standpoint of truly knowing the true God. Two, there was no power with them, no matter how much I loved them. No matter how much I felt they were so deep, there was no power to break the shackles of my sin, to make me live a better life, to change what I called the jerk inside me. What makes the book of Proverbs different is it's God breathed. It will change your life. But isn't it just deep that even as Proverbs 1.5 has Solomon say, a wise man will seek wise counsel and learn even as people were coming to learn from him. Because he alone had the truth of life and God and salvation and wisdom in so many ways. Even as the kings of Egypt, 1 Kings 4, right? 
32 through 34 were coming to him. He was also peeping stuff they did that he liked too, and then using it and God blessed it. Yo, as you navigate daily life, and as you're seeking to learn from God, do you realize the whole world is his classroom? Are you looking to learn from everything around you? Yo, that's deep. That's real deep. Um, time won't allow me to get into how even the Mesopotamians had what was called the instructions of Shurupak, uh, found in 2000 BC. And even in there, it says, my son, let me give you instruction. It was common in this day for people who they wanted to be wise, they wanted to teach their children right and wrong, and they wrote manuscripts. No wonder that in that day, God, to show the world, in a, in a day when the world was loving Proverbs and every civilization and every king's court had their own book of Proverbs, God blesses Solomon to come in and smash the ball out the park with the Proverbs from eternity. Boom. Yeah. I got to get out of here. Salute.